Welcome to another episode of Around the Jewish World in 613 Seconds. Today we're going down under. We're traveling 8,798 miles from Jerusalem, Israel, all the way to Sydney, Australia, to meet the Slavin family, Rabbi David and Leah Slavin. How are you guys doing there? Baruch Hashem, fantastic. And as they say in Australia, good day, mate. <laughs> good day to you. Now, I'm very excited to meet you because you are very well known both in Sydney and in Australia and in the wider Jewish world for the amazing work that you do. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do that, could you give my listeners a little bit of an insight? What's Jewish life like in Australia in 2020? We are extremely blessed that to live as a from year here in Sydney, Australia, we have incredible opportunities meeting the most beautiful, beautiful Nashamas here. And we're just so blessed. Sydney has a very, very beautiful Jewish community about 45,000 Jews, and despite the relatively small numbers, <clears throat> we have a very big infrastructure of Jewish schools, the whole range of the Jewish spectrum and shuls and plenty of kosher food, and it's a really, really beautiful community. Um, there's a greater observant community probably in Melbourne than in Sydney, but nevertheless, Sydney is very, very beautiful. Being that the community is so small, we're so blessed with a, a tremendous unity that because it's small, that everybody mixes together. There's a function, everybody's there because each of us, our communities are so small on the religious community side. So it's very, very beautiful. True. And tell me, in terms of um, anti-Semitism, I know unfortunately that's on the rise globally. Do you experience any type of anti-Semitism in Australia? Nowhere near the levels that our brothers and sisters in Europe are experiencing, or even in America. Uh, Australia is a very tolerant country, and Jews have been very, very much a part of, of the Australian landscape. And the, the average Australian is extremely pro-Jewish and would be very much opposed to any form of anti-Semitic you know, expression. So for that, we're very, very blessed. I'm curious to understand as well, you literally in the Southern Hemisphere live in a totally different way. Right now in the Southern Hemisphere, for you guys, it's winter, for us, it's the summer. And I'm very jealous because when it comes to Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, you have a very short fast. What time does it go out? Early, about 4.35, but then Asar Batavis we make up for it. <laughs> it's amazing, wow. Well, so Asar Batavis will be in the height of winter, in the height of summer. Oh, no, 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 yeah, but it's not like Tisha B'Av. It is. Shavasa Batamas and Tisha B'av is a real pleasure here. There are a lot, of, a lot of big advantages that happen here in Sydney. But interesting, interestingly, we are davening now for Du Fatal, St. Talmud Levracha and Merida Tol, like we do in Israel. So our prayers are not only for what we need here today, um, but rather what our brothers and sisters in Israel and through that what the whole world needs. What other interesting things are there about living down under? Living that under is interesting that this began as a penal colony. And as a result of that, there's a great understanding and appreciation for people who are downtrodden. So the, when you tell somebody that is un-Australian, that's one of the biggest insults you can say. And that's for not being fair or giving people a chance. There's a great willingness to give, as they call it, give somebody a go. Very, very important. Another very interesting Australian thing is being Fear dinkum is what they call it. it. Means simply being straight down the line, being honest, being 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 candid. That's that's considered a very very important thing. Obviously, sports over here is huge. It's a, it really really it's a religion down here. Um, I remember when I first came here 30 years ago. There was a, a general election for the for the prime minister and. Um, I bumped into a policeman in the street, an officer, and I said to him, who do you think is going to win today? And he stopped me and said, oh, probably the Rapidos, which is the local team. He didn't even think I'm talking about the, the national election. It was, it, was, it was a sports game that was first. Uh, that's that. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a great camaraderie still with England, which is quite fascinating. Great respect for the monarchy. We had a number of... Uh, a number of plebiscites and questions being asked, and ultimately, People have always voted to keep it a monarchy so far. So you have the queen on our current. You have our queen on your currency, right? Our queen, like your queen. Fantastic. And as a high school girl, I'm going to add in 
that one Jewish day school was chosen to represent Jewish day schools and one student was chosen, the, high, the school head girl, and I had the merit of meeting the queen and saying a bracha. Oh wow, when she that's came to amazing. The open parliament house. Can you tell me how many generations have you and your family been living in Australia? No, so I'm a first generation Australian, born here and married a New Yorker and brought him down for a visit and happened to, happened to fall in love with the place. So my, my good friend Yitzchok Garson lives in Australia, which is how I got in touch with you. He's also British and he married an Australian and he tells me he loves it and he never wants to leave. And I understand it's so beautiful. What is so special about Sydney? Why does no one want to leave? On every level, Sydney is an absolutely beautiful city. It's big enough to have all the amenities that a large city would have. And yet it's small. You can still take your car into, the, into downtown, into the CBD. People still greet each other, say hello to each other. There's a real, really nice mix. I mean, Sydney's at three and a half million people, and yet there's a very small town feeling to it. Wherever you turn, you know, just step out of our house, and you have the magnificent views of Bondi Beach. You know, a little bit, little drive up, you have the views of the city. So really seeing Hashem's wonders in everywhere you turn is absolutely breathtaking. The people are so friendly. Everything's a bit laid back, slow down, and it's a very, very pleasant and beautiful place to live in. Leah, would you please just tell our listeners about the OBK? What is the OBK? How did you start it? And, and tell us about that. It started off by trade. I'm a hairdresser and went straight into doing weeks for religious women. And it just didn't seem enough. You know, I wanted to do more with this talent that I had given, that I, Hashem had given me. And um, we went into helping cancer patients, Jewish and not Jewish, just giving them the dignity for the during while they're going through chemotherapy, that they should look beautiful. Um, we did that for quite a long time and always with a little white lie at the end or during while we were doing it that I've got extra dinner, I've got extra food and um, just taste it. There wasn't extra dinner, there wasn't extra food, but I just felt having, sending them home with a nice hot meal was something really special. And they would always then come back into my kitchen and cook with me for the next woman. We had one lady that was going through treatment for a very long time and we couldn't manage it in our kitchen home here. We took over a school one day. We had a group of team of volunteers and it was at about 11 o'clock at night. We were still packing away. And I said to my husband, when are we doing this again? You know, when's the next time? Is it next Sunday? Let's get, we've got the teams already. When are we doing it? And he looked at me with the straightest face and he said, I will never do this again. Well, my job is to cry. And I burst out crying. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, and then he had this look and he goes, if I do it, we'll do it with systems. And he could see it already. This picture of this incredible community kitchen took about 12 to 13 years to build. Everything was donated by the incredible support of the building society here. And it's just simply like your kitchen in your home. It's the center of the house. It's the warmth of the house. This has become the center of the Sydney community from all walks of life. People will come in, give us a hand cook roughly about in normal times, about 10,000 meals are going out a month of the most delicious, nutritious meals. And now during COVID, it's, it's, it's more than doubled. You know, our women's refuges have gone up over 30, by 30%. So their demand is a lot more. Um, people with mental health needing, and are not leaving their homes need meals. The street vans going out, a lot of them have stopped going. So the ones that are going need a lot more meals. So just to understand, you've established a social kitchen to enable people who are in need to have a hot, healthy meal. And you're sending out 10,000 right. meals a month. That's incredible. And these meals, they go out to Jewish people, non-Jewish people, people all over Sydney. What an amazing Anyone thing. Anyone that's hungry. What an amazing thing. Now, I understand from my friend and colleague, Rabbi Mendel, that there's an amazing story about somebody who's one of the managers in your kitchen, that there's a program that you run where you invite people who have been in pr prison, who are being rehabilitated into society, to come and spend some time volunteering in your kitchen. And there was one gentleman who came to your kitchen and he's now your manager. And in terms of his rehabilitation, there was a, there was a connection to London, England, because he was rehabilitated through inspiration he found on the internet through Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Do you want to tell us briefly a little bit more about that? While they were still in prison, for the last 10 months of their incarceration, we have a program, they can come out during the day, they wear a GPS tracking ankle bracelet so they can't stray very far. And then they come in to the kitchen, work for the day, go back 
to sleep, and that goes on for the last part, so that when they are released, they're comfortable to go back into society. Now, this particular gentleman, his name is George, a Greek fellow, lovely, lovely guy, came into the kitchen. We, we, we got him employed with us. George, one day in prison, was listening to the BBC, and they were interviewing Rabbi Sachs. And he was totally taken by, well, I don't have to tell you what are the characteristics that can attract somebody to Rabbi Sachs. I think you, you know very, very well. And George just needed to hear more. And uh, he was quite limited. George went in during the explosion of the internet and emails. When he came out, the, the concept that there's a thing called YouTube, you could keep watching something that you want to hear, was really, really very novel to him. And that's what he did. He got on the computer and on YouTube, just kept listening to more and more of Rabbi Sachs' talks. And um, when we became aware of that, I was quite fascinated. And um, recently, for his birthday, we arranged with Rabbi Mendy, whom we're very, very grateful, because I'm sure you guys there get a lot of calls, not only to how to connect to the Almighty, but also to the Lord and Lord, Lord Sachs, uh, <laughs> uh, where people are coming to you. And um, we, we arranged a, one, of, one of the books that he has written. I think it was uh, a, the home we built together. And um, the, the good rabbi took the time to put in a dedication, an autograph to, to George. And when we gave it to him, you know, it was wrapped. Yeah. <laughs> he was, it was very, he was getting emotional. It was a very, very emotional thing for me. He, he, he you know, we pretend like, you know, what is it? It's a book. And then we opened it up. Oh, it looks like it's, it has some writing. And maybe it was from a secondhand shop. And then he started to read it. And his hands started to tremble. He, he, he couldn't believe it. He was so, so touched. And this, is, this, this really made his, made his birthday, made his year. So a tremendous thank you to, to yourself and to the team. I'm going to show our viewers now a short clip of George, who has a message for us all. I came across uh, Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs in 2010. I've heard him be interviewed on BBC Radio through the World Service. And from that moment onwards, I was always captivated by his ability uh, to translate conversation and get it across in a very uh, poignant and a very thoughtful way. His oratory ability is probably second to none. And ever since then, I've been captivated by his ability to transcend uh, right across all forms of obviously media and to, to every single person. Back two years ago, I was fortunate enough to receive a book that book that I received was actually autographed by Rabbi uh, Lord Sachs, and I'm delighted. It's one of my treasured items that I have, and I'll continue to read that book to get a clearer understanding of his philosophies and his teachings. And through that, I've understood he is not only a great orator, a great writer, but I think that he transcends right across to all faiths and religions. Through this facility, we do about 3,500 meals a week now to all different organisations. We support the Jewish community in a very heavy way. We support young mothers, young kids, children of all ages, and then beyond. We support a lot of other charity groups. But I just want to say thank you once again. And if ever the opportunity arises for the Rabbi and Lord Sachs to ever come to Sydney, please make this facility one of your stops. Thank you so much. It's been very inspiring for me to meet Jews all over the world throughout this series, but it's particularly inspiring to see when we have certain links. And it's amazing to see somebody like Rabbi Lord Sachs, who has an impact on Jews throughout the globe. It's really quite amazing. And um, I'm very inspired by the work that you're doing in the social kitchen. Do you have a message to Jews around the world who are going to be watching this clip? I'd like to extend an invitation to all of our brothers and sisters who are watching this anywhere. No warning needed and no invitation needed. Our house is open 27 Watson Street in Bandai, go down to the beach, come in for a Friday night, come in for a Shabbat, or for a barbie during the week. With pleasure, we'd be honored to see you. Or come to the kitchen, roll your sleeves up, and cook a meal, not just for yourself, but for those who need it. Thank you so much.